Hey, welcome to Socialism for All. This file is being recorded for the April 2022 edition of Socialism for All, and it's an audiobook and discussion of why the Social Democrats must declare a determined and relentless war on the Socialist Revolutionaries by Lenin from 1902. If you like this video, please click like and subscribe. And we don't run ads on this channel, so consider supporting on Patreon at patreon.com slash socialism for all. There's a link to Patreon in the video description. So before we get into the credits or the text, I just want to clear up a couple things that might be confusing to newcomers to socialist history about some of the terminology in the title of this piece. So it's called Why the Social Democrats, which we associate today with sort of like reformist welfare capitalists. But back in the day, social democrats were basically, that was the term for Marxists, because the split between what we would call social democrats today and socialists or communists had not really happened yet. So anyway, social democracy was the general term for Marxism. So when he says why the social democrats must declare a determined and relentless war, he means why the Marxists must declare a determined and relentless war on the socialist revolutionaries. Now, from the sound of it, you would think, well, that's like today's communists, right? So revolutionary socialists, but that's not what it is. The social revolutionaries or socialist revolutionaries were a party in Russian left politics at that time, early 20th century. Um, which were basically the successors of the populists, the Narodniki. They were uh, left, they supported the peasants against the landowners, but they were considerably different and distinct from the Bolsheviks or the Mensheviks. And Anyway, so Lenin is basically writing this piece to underline and you know draw attention to some of the differences between the Social Democrats and the Socialist Revolutionaries, and that's what this piece is all about. So... This was written in June and July of 1902. It was first published in 1923 in the magazine Projekior, number 14, and published according to that manuscript. The source is Lenin, Collected Works, Progress Publishers, 1964, Volume 6. The HTML transcription and markup were done by R. Cymbala and D. Walters, and it's in the public domain at the Lenin Internet Archive which is part of the Marxists Internet Archive, found at Marxists.org on the Internet, thanks as usual to MIA for hosting this file, and thousands of other free Marxist texts. One last note from me before we get started with the text. What was going on in the summer of 1902? Well, it had been a few years since Lenin and others had founded Iskra, the Spark, which was the newsletter of their political circle, and the struggle was going in earnest. It was still a few years away from the first Russian Revolution, which was 1905, and then 15 years away from the final Bolshevik Revolution in October of 1917. But things were going in that direction. And so Lenin was, you know, writing this piece to uh, basically make a case for the party that he belonged to versus the socialist revolutionaries. So let's begin. One. Because that trend in our social thought, which goes by the name of socialist revolutionary, is in fact moving away, and has indeed moved away from the only international theory of revolutionary socialism existing today, i.e. from Marxism. In the great split of international social democracy into an opportunist wing, or Bernsteinian, and a revolutionary wing, this trend has taken up an entirely indefinite and impermissibly irresolute position between two stools. Basing itself solely on the bourgeois and opportunist criticism of Marxism, it has pronounced the latter to have been shaken and promised on its part to revise Marxism anew in its own way, but has done nothing whatsoever to fulfill this ominous promise. Footnote there, what does Bernsteinian mean? So Edward Bernstein was one of the chief early distorters and just destroyers of Marxism. He opposed key tenets of Marxism, such as class struggle and the need for revolution, and Lenin was a big opponent of him. So basically, in point one here, Lenin is accusing the socialist revolutionaries of, in the face of a big you know, split within Marxism, uh, of them not picking a side, which is something you actually need to do in a time of crisis for Marxism. You need to actually defend the correct side against the attacks and distortions. So Lenin says that the socialist revolutionaries based themselves on the bourgeois 
and opportunist criticisms of Marxism. So in other words, not good-natured proletarian criticisms, but bourgeois opportunist really attacks on Marxism taking the guise of criticism. And uh, so the socialist revolutionaries are promising to revise it anew, but Lenin says that they haven't really done anything uh, to fulfill, quote, this ominous promise. Like, okay, you're promising to do something. It sounds uh, <laughs> maybe even if you do it, like it wouldn't be a good thing, but they haven't even done anything. So continuing. Point two, because the socialist revolutionary trend helplessly yields to the dominant tendency in Russian social and political thought, which should be termed liberal narrativism. Repeating the era of the Narodnaya Volya and of old Russian socialism in general, the socialist revolutionaries fail to see the sheer flabbiness and internal contradictions of this tendency. Their independent creative contribution to Russian revolutionary thought is restricted to tacking revolutionary phrases on to the Old Testament of liberal Narodnik wisdom. Russian Marxism was the first to undermine the theoretical foundations of liberal narrativism, to lay bare its bourgeois and petty bourgeois class content, and to have waged and continue to wage war against it, undeterred by the desertion of a swarm of critical, read opportunist, Marxists to the enemy camp. But the stand the socialist revolutionaries have been holding in this war is at best one of hostile neutrality. Here again they have seated themselves between two stools between Russian Marxism, from which they have borrowed only a few paltry shreds, and quasi-socialist liberal narrativism. 3. Because the socialist revolutionaries, owing to their above-mentioned complete lack of principle in questions of international and Russian socialism, do not understand or do not recognize the only really revolutionary principle, that of the class struggle. They do not understand that only a party which fuses socialism with the Russian working class movement, being engendered with increasing force and on an increasing scale by the growth of Russian capitalism, can be really revolutionary and truly socialist in Russia today. The attitude of the socialist revolutionaries toward the Russian working class movement has always been that of dilettante spectators, and when, for instance, that movement contracted the illness of economism as a consequence of its amazingly rapid growth, the socialist revolutionaries, on the one hand, gloated over the mistakes made by people who were working at the new and difficult task of rousing the masses of the workers, and on the other hand, put a spoke in the wheel of revolutionary Marxism when it launched and victoriously carried through the struggle against this economism. Quick footnote, what is economism? Economism is when you limit the struggle from any revolutionary aims and you focus solely on improvements for the working class under capitalism. Better pay, better conditions, better schedules, etc. The correct thing to do is always to agitate for as much as you can get, but never lose sight of the need to end capitalism. And as quickly as possible at that. But economism does exactly that. It basically puts kind of a lot of faith in bourgeois intellectuals and backs off of revolutionary goals. Continuing. A half-hearted attitude towards this working class movement inevitably leads, in fact, to aloofness from it. And owing to this aloofness, the Socialist Revolutionary Party has no social basis whatever. It does not rely upon any social class, for the term class cannot be applied to a group of unstable intellectuals who qualify their vagueness and lack of principle as broadness. Another comment there that's the end of point three is when Lenin says they do not understand that only a party which fuses socialism with the Russian working class movement being engendered with increasing force and on an increasing scale by the growth of Russian capitalism. So the socialist revolutionaries like the populists that came before them held some theories such as that the peasantry was the revolutionary class and that Russia could go directly from feudalism to socialism, and these theories were basically opposed by Lenin. Continuing. 4. Because by assuming a disdainful attitude towards socialist ideology and seeking to rely simultaneously and in an equal degree upon the intelligentsia, the proletariat, and the peasantry, the Socialist Revolutionary Party thereby inevitably, whether it wants to or not, leads to the political and ideological enslavement of the Russian proletariat by Russian bourgeois democracy. A disdainful attitude towards theory, 
evasiveness and shilly-shallying with regard to socialist ideology inevitably play into the hands of bourgeois ideology. As social strata comparable with the proletariat, the Russian intelligentsia and the Russian peasantry can serve as the mainstay only of a bourgeois democratic movement. This is not only a consideration that stems necessarily from our teachings as a whole, which regard the small producer, for instance, as revolutionary only to the extent that he makes a clean break with the society of commodity economy and capitalism and places himself at the standpoint of the proletariat. No, it is also an absolute fact which is already beginning to make itself felt. At the moment of the political revolution and on the day after this revolution, this fact will inevitably make itself felt with still greater force. Socialist revolutionarism is one of the manifestations of petty bourgeois ideological instability and petty bourgeois vulgarization of socialism, against which social democracy must and will always wage determined war. Point five. Because the practical demands of the program which the socialist revolutionaries have, I won't say brought forward, but at least outlined, have already quite clearly revealed the enormous harm caused in practice by the unprincipled character of this trend. For example, their agrarian minimum program, as outlined in issue 8 of Revolutionaya Russia, this was an illegal newspaper of the Socialist Revolutionaries published from the end of 1900 in Russia by the League of Socialist Revolutionaries, and then in Geneva from January 1902 to December 1905, that agrarian minimum program, as outlined, or perhaps it would be more correct to say, scattered among the time-worn premises of our narratism, in the first place misleads both the peasantry by promising it a minimum socialization of the land, and the working class by giving it an entirely wrong impression of the true nature of the peasant movement. Such frivolous promises only compromise a revolutionary party in general. In particular, they compromise the teaching of scientific socialism concerning the socialization of all means of production as our ultimate aim. Secondly, by including the support and development of cooperatives in their minimum program, the socialist revolutionaries completely abandon the ground of revolutionary struggle and degrade their so-called socialism to the level of the most banal, petty bourgeois reformism. Thirdly, by opposing the demand of the social democrats for the abolition of all the medieval fetters that bind our village commune, tie the mujik to his allotment, deny him freedom of movement, and unavoidably entail his humiliation as member of his social estate, the socialist revolutionaries have shown that they have not even been able to safeguard themselves against the reactionary doctrines of Russian narrativism. 6. Because the socialist revolutionaries, by including terrorism in their program, and advocating it in its present-day form as a means of political struggle, are thereby doing the most serious harm to the movement, destroying the indissoluble ties between socialist work and the mass of the revolutionary class. No verbal assurances and vows can disprove the unquestionable fact that present-day terrorism, as practiced and advocated by the socialist revolutionaries, is not connected in any way with work among the masses, for the masses, or together with the masses that the organization of terroristic acts by the party distracts our very scanty organizational forces from their difficult and by no means completed task of organizing a revolutionary workers' party, that in practice the terrorism of the socialist revolutionaries is nothing else than single combat, a method that has been wholly condemned by the experience of history. Even foreign socialists are beginning to become embarrassed by the noisy advocacy of terrorism advanced today by our socialist revolutionaries. Among the masses of the Russian workers, this advocacy simply sows harmful illusions, such as the idea that terrorism, quote, compels people to think politically, even against their will, quoted from Revolutionary Russia, issue 7, page 4, or that, quote, more effectively than months of verbal propaganda, it is capable of changing the views of thousands of people with regard to the revolutionaries and the meaning of their activity, unquote, or that it is capable of, quote, infusing new strength into the waverers, those discouraged and shocked by the sad outcome of many demonstrations, unquote, and so on. These harmful illusions can only bring about early disappointment and weaken the work of preparing the masses for the onslaught upon the autocracy. So that's the end of the audiobook. So again, this was pretty early, 1902, still three years before the first Russian Revolution, in which some reforms were exacted from the Tsarist regime. 
Uh, and it was not the last time by far that Lenin would write criticisms of the socialist revolutionaries. In fact, in the end, I mean in the very end, like 1917, it would be a faction of the socialist revolutionaries who, you know, transformed by 15 plus years of struggle at that point, eventually did see the value in supporting the Bolsheviks against some of the other factions who, in 1917, you know, the Mensheviks and some of the other socialist revolutionaries were just flat out backing the bourgeois provisional government and were just preparing to pave the way for post-Tsarist capitalism in Russia. Some of them, again, did come over in the end to the Bolsheviks, helped the Bolsheviks to win political control of the Soviets, and this was fairly decisive as far as uh, the October Revolution 1917 was concerned. Anyway, we're going to leave it there for now. What do you think? Leave a question or comment in the comment section below. We'll continue the discussion there as always. In the meantime, thanks for listening. And thanks to the current patrons whose names are on the screen. Again, we do not run ads on this channel, so the people whose names you see here are the only ones we're getting financial support from right now, and we really appreciate it. If you'd like to get your name on the screen and contribute financial support, head to patreon.com slash socialism for all. You can sign up for as little as $2 a month or more, whatever you see fit. Every contribution is encouraging. They are also materially helpful. So thank you for those as they have allowed me to spend a lot more time creating more content than I would have been able to do without that support. Beyond that, engagement with the channel, liking, sharing, subscribing, and commenting, even if it's just thanks or good video, all of that helps to boost the channel in the YouTube algorithm, helps more people to see and stumble across this content. That's what we're trying to do. It is socialism for all. We're trying to make this as accessible as possible so that working class people have that much easier a time getting their hands on some quality information and analysis from a working class perspective. Finally, all the education, analysis, and agitation in the world will only get you so far. Remember to join an organization, find something in your community that is doing the kind of work you'd like to be a part of that is supporting working class people in breaking free from capitalist domination of our lives. This can be political parties, not the Democrats, not the Democratic Party, let me say that again, not the Democratic Party, but political parties being organized by and for workers that don't take capitalist money, labor unions, tenant unions, other community organizations helping people come together in struggle for better conditions and an eventual end to capitalism. Join it, get involved, take this education and agitation with you, network with other like-minded people, build strong organizations, and in this way we can make a movement that can actually produce real political change of and for working people, not just some better kind of capitalism. All right, thanks again, and we will catch you in the next video.